Now let's talk quickly about a native API. The native API is the original API uh, created for the free RTOS. One remark, uh, in the configuration you can hide the native API if you want to use only the CMC's RTOS API. So the one compatible across different RTOS's. Uh, the native API still is underneath the CMC's RTOS implementation. So I recommend to keep the access here and uh, time to time because uh, CMC's RTOS uh, uh, standardizes the way how the RTOS's uh, are used. It can miss some specific functionalities that are still available in the native API. So if you want, uh, you can use it you can still include it in your application. The native API has got some conventions like uh, for variable names it has got a prefix that uh, shows what type of the variable it is. So whether its type is uh, character, short, long, pointer, unsigned, uh, specific return type, when we speak about functions, hey, again, it has got a prefix uh, telling what uh, return value it gives. So uh, whether it doesn't give anything or a port base type, uh, specific type or return value, and whether the function is private or public. So this way you can very easily recognize what the function returns, what parameters it takes. Further, uh, it gives you uh, macros. Uh, these macros uh, uh, are uh, constructed so that the first part of the macro uh, defines the file where such macro is defined. So you can see that, for example, if it uh, begins with a PD, it is defined in the project definitions. So you can very easily look for a specific a set of uh, values that are uh, tied to this uh, specific type. There are as well uh, macro definitions for uh, common return values and parameters like uh, true, false, pass, fail, so, you, so that you can test the functions for return values. On top of the native API, the FreeRTOS defines the CMC's OS API. You know what the CMC's uh, OS API means? The CMC's is a standard defined by ARM with a big help of ST uh, where uh, ARM standardized the Cortex-M functionality. The macros and functions that help you to control any microcontroller based on the Cortex M cores. So uh, the API was adapted by a lot of uh, vendors like our competitors and uh, there is uh, uh, I think more than 200 companies now implemented, implementing different Cortex M microcontrollers. So a lot of them use the CMCs as an interchangeable code. ARM uh, realized that uh, because there are a lot of uh, ports of different uh, real-time operating systems running on top of Cortex-M, they decided to standardize uh, the API for the real-time operating systems as well. So they created uh, their own API that takes the common functions from these uh, real-time operating systems and uh, offered the API First, it was implemented on top of the RTX, which uh, is an in-house operating system created by Kyle, belonging to ARM now. Then it was implemented on the FreeRTOS, and it became a de facto standard for uh, Cortex-M-based devices. It's as well very nice and easy to use. So. It's a generic uh, interface for Cortex-M based uh, processors. It uses as well some middleware components, but uh, these are independent from RTOS's 
and it allows uh, easy transfer from one RTOS vendor to the other. It uh, as well defines a minimum set of functionality like uh, management of the tasks, control of the kernel, uh, semaphore, queue and mail management, and uh, the definition of the memory allocation and the allocation. When we work with the CubeMX and uh, our software stacks, we use this uh, CMC's RTOS API by default so that uh, if uh, in future we decide to move to another RTOS, we can do it very easily. Now we can see uh, the implementation uh, in the CMC's OS.C file and where to find it. And uh, you can see the examples of uh, the differences between the native API of the FreeRTOS and the CMC's RTOS uh, counterpart. One big advantage of the CMC's RTOS is that it's uh, more readable. So you can see kernel start underneath the task start scheduler with a void return parameter. Thread create, X task define, X task create, OS semaphore create, here you can choose X semaphore create binary or counting, and so on and so on. So the CMC's RTOS always begins with the OS and then the description of the function, which is, uh, I would say, very nicely readable. The CMC's RTOS uh, uh, still uses underneath the original operating system. So it's a wrap-up layer, uh, which means if you call the OS function, it will take all the parameters, it will make uh, some security checks, for example, and uh, then it will call the original function. So yes, a couple of clock cycles on top. On the other side, uh, from programmer's point of view, it has a very good benefit uh, because it standardizes functions. For example, and the uh, OS, uh, uh, for example, message put, when you uh, put some data into the, into the queue of messages for a given task, uh, if you operate in a standard uh, inter-task communication, you can call OS message put uh, like it is, and you would as well call the same thing uh, in the native API. But if you call this function from an interrupt, the situation changes. The CMC's RTOS will again use the OS message put function. So there is no change and you don't care whether you are in interrupt or in a standard task. But uh, for the native RTOS API, you would need uh, to call uh, something like uh, X message transmit or send from ISR. While uh, the OS message put uh, will look into the context of the processor and it will decide whether it's in the interrupt or in the task and it will choose the appropriate native function. So it makes your life easier even if it costs you a little bit of uh, clock cycles more. Most of the CMC's OS functions return the OS status value that uh, you can check uh, for uh, OK, timeout, a message received. Uh, so it's a different combination of return values and flags that can be tested. And uh, it gives you uh, quite a big control of uh, what the system is doing. For example, if you don't implement a memory overflow hook, when you uh, request a new heap memory, new chunk of memory, uh, the function will return a null pointer and it will as well give you the return status that it failed. So if you test for the return status, you know that uh, you should not proceed with your function because there is no memory allocated. Uh, that's uh, where the OS status uh, can be helpful. Additionally, each object that you create has got its own ID and uh, you can see the ID defined uh, depending on the object used. So, 
you can as well see that it's uh, mapped to the original handle of the native RTOS and uh, I would say that uh, it's effectively just a typecasted type. So it's very easy if you take uh, the OS semaphore ID and you simply pass it to the native function after typecasting. The delays in your application are given in milliseconds and uh, uh, they have some special meanings or special values have special meanings. So null zero means there is no delay. If you, for example, wait for a mutex, you define in a function how much time you want to spend waiting for the mutex. If you put zero, you only test if the mutex is available now and the function immediately returns with the information mutex is there or not. So you don't wait for it. Anything bigger than zero is a delay in milliseconds and it's used for waiting for a specific time. However, there exists a special value called uh, wait forever, OS wait forever, that's defined as uh, minus one in 32 bits and uh, it defines infinite time. So if you don't want to uh, define a timeout, but uh, you still need to wait for something forever, this is the right macro or value to put into a function and the task will get blocked without the timing mechanism. Now let's look at the OS status values. You can see that uh, when everything goes well, it returns OS OK with a value zero. So here it's not that if the function returns a positive value, it's fine. Here you have to test if the return parameter equals equals OS OK. Or we have got uh, another things like if uh, you wait for a signal, you should check if the function returns the OS event signal or message or mail. But if it times out, it will give you an OS event timeout. So typically you have to test what is the return value of a specific function and decide whether the result is positive. So you got some message or uh, whether you got a timeout. If uh, we have got some errors, there are different things uh, uh, like uh, additional errors defined. And you can see them listed here. So even errors have uh, their own values. And you can see that if you uh, test for the bit seven, you typically uh, are able to recognize that the error came. The goal of this part is to demonstrate how we can use STM32CubeMX to prepare an application which is using FreeRTLS. We will reuse an empty project prepared for STM32L476 VGT6 uh, microcontroller. So as you can see we've got uh, an empty project, there is nothing assigned to the pins and uh, we can start new application. The first thing we need to do is to uh, select the debug interface pins. So I go to system core sys, I select within the debug tab serial wire, so I can see both debug pins present. And the second thing, very important uh, here, is to select the different time-based source. Time-based source uh, is in fact the timer which is used by the HAL library uh, with the code generated by CubeMX and what is important is that the same timer, Sysdic, is used as well, is dedicated for free RTS as a time base for this system. It is not recommended to use Sysdic for both purposes, so for HAL library and free RTS, so we need to select a different time base source for HAL library. What we can select, we can select any other timer which is available within the microcontroller. What I would recommend here is to use either timer 6 or timer 7, 
which are timers without any input nor output channels. Those are dedicated to synchronize other peripherals and to generate the simple time base. I would select uh, timer uh, 7 in this case. And uh, if now, if I would go to the timers, I can see that timer 7 is not accessible anymore for me. And I've got the message that this timer is used uh, for system time base. Okay, so this is the first, uh, the first point. The second point is to add FreeRTOS library. We can do it uh, as well for, within pinout and configuration tab, going into the middleware section, and now I can see FreeRTOS. And uh, when I click on it, I can select the interface. There are two options here, CMC's V1 and V2. Uh, what is uh, used uh, within HAL libraries and the uh, stm 32 cubemx is in fact uh, the FreeRTOS API with an additional layer, which is called CMC's OS layer. Uh, there are two files, CMC's OS.c and CMC's OS.h. We are describing this API uh, with a different section of this uh, training. So for our purposes, I would select CMC's V2. And now I can see the configuration for the free RTOS. There are a lot of tabs uh, within this. Uh, now we will focus on two most important ones. Config parameters, which is the main configuration of the free RTOS, and include parameters which is used to select the modules, the functions, which would be included into our code. Please remember that if you are not using uh, any of those functions, it is highly recommended to disable it. So to uh, not include it into the code, to not extend, to not increase the code size of your application. Let's uh, come back uh, for a while into the config uh, parameters. As you can see, some of the options are not accessible for us. Those are the API version, uh, free RTOS version, CMC's RTOS uh, version. Uh, but most of the, of the fields are still uh, available for us. We will describe most of them, the most important ones, within different sections about the configuration of the free RTOS. So let's uh, not uh, focus on it uh, here. So the second option, the include parameters, we already described. Um, we can enable or disable the function which could be included into our code. Uh, then we've got some user const constants which can be uh, used as well for us. And the rest of the tabs are related to particular parts of our, our RTOS uh, system. So, starting from tasks and queues, uh, I can see uh, here two parts of this window. The first one is tasks, where I can add, delete, modify the tasks I would like to generate within my FreeRTOS application. By default, there is only one task created, it's so-called default task with the priority normal, uh, stack size uh, 128 bytes, and uh, the entry function, which is called start default task. Uh, I can change it uh, by double click on, on this, uh, this line. And now I can change the name, priority, stack size, entry function, and as well, code generation option, parameters and allocation can be either dynamic or static. So this is uh, how we can modify existing tasks. If you would like to add something, I just press add. I can see the new window uh, where I can put the information about my new uh, task. If I press OK, I can see the second, uh, second task uh, present. I can do uh, similar operations for the queues. So as you can see below, I have no queues uh, by default, so I can add one of those. Uh, here I need to put the name, queue size, so number of elements which uh, would be uh, inside the queue, and the size of uh, one particular element. Queue will contain, uh, the, in this case, queue will contain 16 elements, and each of these elements would be uh, the size of 16-bit without sign. 
if I press OK, I can see this new uh, queue as, as a defined. I can change uh, settings of this queue, its name, uh, size or item size by double click on its name, like with the tasks. Then the next step uh, is about the timers and semaphores. If I click uh, here, I can see the first uh, part is about the software timers. The second one is a binary semaphores and counting semaphores. So for the uh, for the timers, if I click OK, I can see as well the name of the of the timer, its callback, so the function which will be called when the timer will overflow, and uh, the type of the timer. The timer uh, can be periodic or one shot. Uh, we've got a dedicated uh, section within our training on software timers, so we can you can have a look on these. And again, if I press Add, I've got some default settings, um, and I can see my timer. And if I would like to edit existing timer, I just double click on its name. The same story is uh, with uh, binary semaphores. So if I click Add, I've got only two fields: the name of the semaphore and its allocation because binary semaphore, it is uh, something either turn on or turn off. There are no parameters, there are no values, no variables inside, inside this. Uh, so it's very simple uh, component of the operating system. I can see the binary semaphore edit. The same uh, story is with the counting semaphores. The only difference is that with the counting semaphores, we've got an additional component uh, variable, which is count. Because counting semaphore uh, can be given or and taken a few times, uh, depending on the value we will set during its creation. So if I press add, let's change its name. Semaphore C and T, and I will change this to into the into five. If I press OK, I can see its name. Semaphore. CNT count five dynamic allocation. It means that we will have the semaphore uh, name named uh, semaphore underscore CNT, which can be taken five times, and then it should be given maximum times five times. So this is um, this is uh, an extension of the binary semaphore, and again we've got a dedicated. Uh, Part within this session, which is about the semaphores, binary and counting. So you can refer to this uh, part for more information. The next tab uh, is about mutexes. If I click here, I can see two um, fields. I can see mutexes and recursive mutexes. Mutex is an extended version of the of the semaphore, uh, which is giving a more um, mechanisms uh, which are protecting the tasks uh, which are operating with the mutex. The creation of the mutex is very similar um, to, 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 to the semaphore, so I just click add, and because, as you can see we've got only the name of the mutex, I would just change this name into the mutex, mutex1, and that's it. So it's, it's very, very simple. Um, more information about the mutexes you will find in the related part of this training uh, later on. Additional tab uh, is about the uh, heap usage. So it's very, very useful one because it's demo it demonstrates to you how uh, much memory you have already consumed and uh, how much of it uh, you've got still uh, available for your, uh, for your operating system. As you can see at the beginning, uh, we've got heap still available in bytes. So uh, we've got uh, still 1,300 bytes available for our system from allocated uh, 3,000 bytes. Then what we use so far is 1,700 bytes. And as you can see, most of this uh, has been consumed by the tasks. Uh, then some part uh, for the queues. So a little bit for timers and uh, uh, 264 bytes for mutexes and semaphores. And then you've got uh, more details. Uh, you've got uh, how many bytes um, has been consumed by each task and then uh, each queue, each timer, each uh, mutex, 
and uh, semaphores. So it's very useful. It demonstrates to you uh, whether you need to increase or decrease the size of the heap which you declared within the config parameters. So this is uh, uh, this is the area where you are declaring the size of the heap. So total heap size is a RAM memory declared to store the information, the variable information about the components of the operating system. It has been defined by default as 3000 bytes. We'll have uh, next section would be dedicated for the configuration of the operating system so you can learn a bit more about each of the parameters you can see right now on the screen. This is the configuration of the FreeRTOS. Important point is to properly configure the uh, interrupts within the system which is working with FreeRTOS. Let me go to the system view to NVIC to demonstrate you how it is uh, how it is done. Now what you can see uh, is the list of available interrupts uh, with the in, within the system. So um, what you can see there are some system interrupts which are enabled by default and then you can see the priority uh, priority number. Uh, at the moment we've got three values uh, 0, 15 and 5. 0 means uh, the highest possible priority. It is assigned to the system uh, interrupts. Uh, 15 is, uh, in our case, the lowest possible priority, as we've got four bits uh, available to set the priority level. And those two uh, interrupts are related to op our operating system, to system context switch. We will describe this topic more in details uh, when we will discuss about the scheduler. So now please have a look that uh, the switching of the context has a lowest possible priority. It is done uh, to not block any hardware component, any hardware peripheral uh, by the operating system. So as you can see, the operating system, the free RTS, in the embedded system uh, is working as a, an additional layer which should not interact in a negative way, it should not delay any of the hardware interrupts which are present within the system. This is why the switching of the context has a lowest possible priority. Below you can find a few interrupts uh, which has been assigned uh, by the priority number five. This number five is coming from our configuration of FreeRTS. Let me come back for a while to FreeRTS configuration. So I click on this FreeRTS. I go to the config parameters and I scroll down at the end. Please have a look on two last fields within this, uh, within this config parameters. The first one, library lowest interrupt priority. It is a definition uh, configuration of the lowest possible priority which is available within our embedded system, within, uh, in our case within Cortex-M4. So in this case it is 15, as uh, within STM32 we are using 4 bits only. Uh, and the second, and this interrupt would be assigned to the interrupts which are used to switching the context, as you already seen on previous screen. The second component where we've got this value 5, it is uh, the constant called library max Cisco interrupt priority. And uh, this uh, constant, uh, this define, is uh, setting the maximum uh, level of the priority of the interrupt, which can still execute uh, API, so functions from the operating systems. Uh, this is a very important point due to the fact that uh, all of the operations within operating system, so switching the context, uh, changing the uh, priority of the of the task, waiting for the semaphore, waiting for the queue, changing anything within the semaphore queue mutexes, or any change within the components of the operating system, is done with so-called critical sections. All the critical sections within the free RTS are done in such a way that we are blocking all interrupts 
uh, with the level which is uh, set to library max syscall interrupt priority. So we are blocking those interrupts which can execute any of the function from the operating system. We are not blocking interrupts which are related to the hardware and do not use any function of the operating system. So this is this uh, number five we've seen within the NVIC configuration. And at the moment, uh, the other components have assigned this number uh, five. And then if you go on the right side, you can see use free test functions. This use free test functions means that uh, all those interrupts which has selected this column must have the interrupt level between 5 and 15. We can, we can have a look on the first example. As you can see, I've got, I can have a selection from 5 to 15. Lower number is not possible due to the fact that we configured in a freertsconfig.h file, so within the freertsconfiguration configuration, this uh, level as a maximum uh, priority level uh, for the interrupts which could execute uh, freer test uh, functions. So this is this is the configuration of uh, of any interrupts. We will come back to this point uh, later on within the uh, description of the operating system. The rest of the components, uh, including the code generation, including the DMA configuration, is completely the same like with the different uh, STM32 CubeMX uh, application. We will not uh, spend time uh, on, this, uh, on this part. This is all information I would like to pass to you within this section. Thank you for watching this video. Within this part, we will discuss a bit about FreeRTS configuration. Most of the configuration parameters are set within FreeRTS config.h file. It is a source file, which is one of the key components of the operating system, and those components are completely independent on the platform. The most important parameters you can see right now on the screen. So the first one is config use preemption which is defining whether our operating system will work in a preemption mode or cooperative mode. We are describing the difference between those two in next uh, parts of this uh, training. The second component is about the clock of the CPU given in Hertz. It is automatically set uh, by stm 32 cubemix what you will see a bit uh, later on. Then we've got a tick rate in Hertz. So how often our context would be switched it is, uh, in fact, configuring one of the timers, in our case it will be Sysdic, to generate an interrupt, which would uh, trigger the context switch, so the switch between the tasks of the operating system. The next parameter, very important one, is number of the priorities we will use within our application. Then total heap size is defining how much memory we will have within the RAM to store the information about our operating system components, each variables, so the tasks, semaphores, queues, mutexes, software timers, all of those components require some space within the RAM memory to store the uh, temporary variables, to store its configuration, its parameters. All of those must be allocated somehow on the RAM memory, and it is done within this heap size dedicated to operating system. What is important is that the total heap size is given in bytes once the other components like uh, the stack size of the tasks is given in words. Please uh, have a look on this. It is quite well visible within the stm 32 cubemix application, but if you would uh, edit this uh, freertos config.h file manually, please uh, be aware on those differences. The last two components are related to the interrupt priorities to configure the system in such a way that operating system will not negatively interact 
with the hardware, with the other parts of the embedded system. So the first component, config library lowest interrupt priority. It is in fact the lowest interrupt priority which is available in our system. In Cortex-M for up, uh, cut, in Cortex-M for uh, implementation done with an STM32L4 devices, which we are using in this uh, training, uh, this lowest interrupt priority is uh, 15. This uh, level of the interrupts would be used by the interrupts which are responsible for the context switch. Then the next component, uh, config library max syscall interrupt priority, is the highest interrupt priority, highest number, which uh, would be used for the interrupts uh, which needs to execute any of the function from the operating system. So if we set here, for example, 5, it means that all the interrupts which needs to execute any of the operating system functions must have its priority set between 5 and 15. So this between this max syscall and the lowest interrupt priority. Interrupts with the priority which, is, which has lower number, so in fact higher priority, so 4, 3, 2, 1 and 0, uh, would uh, be completely independent from the operating system uh, and would be not blocked by the operating system in any, any context switch location on a, any critical sections which are used uh, within the free RTS. Let's have a look on other config parameters important within the free RTS system. I came back uh, to stm 32 cubemix as uh, so we can see all of the parameters uh, from our freertos config.h file here, uh, so it's much easier to manipulate on this uh, graphical interface. So we already discussed about the preemption, as you can see the clock, uh, CPU clock in Hertz is given uh, by, the, by the tool itself, so it's automatically generated using the information from clock configuration from this application. Then the tick rate is given in Hertz, uh, we can change it. Uh, right now it is 1 kilohertz. Uh, then maximum number of priorities is set uh, to 56 and it's constant. Then we've got a minimum stack size and uh, please have a look. Uh, this uh, number is given in words and it's used uh, for the task creation. If you create a new task uh, it will have by default this value 128 words as um, stack size. Then we've got a maximum task name length given in signs, so uh, we've got uh, 16. Then we've got some components which would be used, can be used uh, within the application. So as you can see, most of them are right, right now enabled. It has this drawback that uh, any enable additional functionality will increase the total size of uh, operating system of the code uh, which we would generate later on. From the most important parameters, which what we would need to discuss now, is a memory management setting. As you can see right now, we've got a memory allocation set of dynamic and static. Most of the operations we will do as a dynamic memory with the dynamic memory allocation. The next component is a total heap size. So this is the total memory which would be allocated in RAM uh, to store the variables, to store the local uh, local data of each operating system component and as you can see this time it is given in bytes so we allocated 3000 bytes for the heap size of the operating system the next point uh, is a memory management scheme uh, by default it is heap 4 we can select uh, heap 1 2 3 4 and 5 we've got a dedicated part within this session about those memory management schemes. Uh, then uh, we've got the uh, so-called hook functions which are used uh, during the development uh, phase because those allows you to monitor the behavior of your application which is using the free RTS. Below you can see the runtime statistics uh, which are used as well uh, during the development phase. 
Uh, coroutines, uh, this is the mechanism so which is used within the free RTOS when you are using this system with uh, smaller microcontrollers, 8, uh, 16 bits. So as you can see, these uh, are disabled uh, for Cortex-M devices because uh, we are using uh, full-size uh, tasks, not uh, coroutines. Uh, below you will find uh, software timer definitions, which are by default enabled. And the interrupt uh, uh, priority levels we already described. So this is the first part concerning the config parameters. The second one, related to this one, is in the next tab, is called include parameters. This tab uh, allows us to disable or enable the function which would be included uh, into our free RTOS implementation. So we can add some additional functionality to our system if needed, but we should remember about one important point. If we enable some of those functions, the total code size of our application will be much bigger, can be much bigger because all of those functions contain some uh, part of the code. Uh, from the most important uh, components, uh, the functions which are present here, I, I could uh, name, for example, task priority set, task priority get, which allows you to manipulate on the priorities of the tasks. Then task delete, which allows you to delete unused task uh, if needed. Then uh, we've got task suspend, which is uh, uh, blocking the, inter the, the task for some time. And then task delay which is uh, switching as well the task from the running state to the delay state for a given time. Uh, so you can see much more of those functions. Most of them would be described in the further sections of this uh, training. So as you can see within the STM32Cube MX application, you can define all the configuration for the free RTS system. All what you will set here will be stored later on during the code generation within the freertos config.h file and you can manipulate on this file manually later on or you can use as well this configurator to make any modification and regenerate the code. Thank you for watching this video. Now we're getting to uh, heap to memory management and what heap to choose. There are actually five types of heap. Each one will provide you with a different memory allocation, memory freeing, and it's a usually a completely different scheme. So I will try to explain in the next slides. Yeah, as said before, for uh, Priatos, there's a specific memory area in which you has a heap. In this heap, there might be some FreeRTOS resources that was selected before that you initialized, like some tasks, queues. Every queue and task has its control block, which is uh, allocated in its, uh, on its own stack. If uh, you are running your application without FreeRTOS, you just simply call malloc or free if you, for dynamic allocation. But if you are in a operating system, you need some thread safe functions. In this case, there are two dedicated for this operations, PV port malloc and PV port free. You just don't use free or malloc. You need to specify total heap size in the, the free artos config header file. And if you are not sure if um, there is enough of the space for the heap, you can call X port get free heap size function, uh, which uh, will return the value of, of the heap space unallocated. Each task or even queue or other resource need to have its control block and it is allocated in a heap. You can enable some task notifications, trace facility and mutexes in the heap. Usually this is already predefined and you can define it in a cubemx, but if you really want to change it later, you can do it uh, do it in a cubemx and re then regenerate, or you can go straight to the configuration file and change these values right there. 
but this uh, the change will be not propagated if you regenerate the project. The control block size uh, is d depends on the option that you enable in the configuration file. When you're creating a task, you need to pass uh, the stack uh, stack size dedicated for this task as an argument in the uh, thread def function that you can see at the very beginning of, at the very end of uh, all the arguments in, in the function. For each task, there is allocated the control block size plus four times task stack size. The reason is that the number is given in words. You need to define as well the minimal stack size and uh, this size is taken by idle task. Uh, when you run your tasks and uh, you need to know how much uh, memory was used by the task, uh, the FreeRTOS uses uh, a method of counting the known keyword in the stack. So when the stack is defined uh, in the heap, uh, it is filled with a known value that uh, normally should not be present anywhere in uh, the program execution. When uh, you want to know how much memory was allocated by your task in its own stack, you can test uh, for the watermark. This is uh, the last uh, modified word in the memory. So uh, when you call the function of uh, UX uh, task get stack high watermark, the function will take the ID of the task that you want to present or a current one and it will traverse the stack of this task and it will count how many words are still unchanged. And this will give you the watermark, hey, my stack allocated only up to this level and everything else is available. So if you uh, take from the TCB the length of the stack and uh, the watermark, you can subtract them and uh, you automatically know how much space wasn't used. So it's a reserve for you or the stack can be reduced by this amount to spare some memory. It's a very useful thing because uh, when you define the heap, you must define its size so that uh, all the objects fit inside, but the whole heap fits as well in your memory, which can be quite complicated. When we speak about other objects, uh, the objects uh, take as well some amount uh, of bytes in the heap when uh, their object is created. So when I create a message queue, it takes a number of elements multiplied by element size plus some default thing like uh, 16 bytes for description of the queue and so on. Additionally, when we operate uh, with software timers, then again, uh, we have to enable the usage of the timers with a macro. And uh, when uh, the timers are added to our configuration, during initialization of the kernel, the timer task is created. It's additional task that uh, is responsible for processing the timing events. So if you create a software timer, the timer task will take care about uh, the proper scheduling. And uh, when the proper time comes for your asynchronous function, the timer task will call this callback and will pass the control to this asynchronous function. So you can uh, schedule that, uh, for example, every five seconds or in 20 seconds or in 50 milliseconds, I want to call this function. So you put it into the timer queue. The timer task will order the events depending on the time and it will wait until the proper time comes. Then it calls the function. Beware that uh, the function is called in the context of this timer task, which means that your function will share the stack with the timer task, which means when you create the timer task, you have to define stack big enough to fit as well the variables of your callback functions. It's a typical mistake where you leave the timer task uh, like it is with some small stack and you put a function that uh, uses a lot of local variables. And then everything works and suddenly when it comes to this function, it still finishes properly, but when it returns to the other functions, suddenly you get strange crashes of the application. Why? Because uh, 
the local variables of the function called in the timer task overwrote some other data from other tasks or other objects and uh, when it for example overwrote uh, the structure of the queue or a mutex well then uh, it's destroyed and when you try to use it it has very interesting effects typically it's very hard to debug at that moment you would need to take uh, the list of the tasks and look at the usage of their stack and if you see that the timer one is completely full and exhausted you have to increase this parameter additionally uh, you can as well play with the priority of this timer task if you want uh, the functions running at a very high priority so at a precise time you should put as well the timer task at high priority but uh, if of course uh, you don't want to disturb your code you can put the timer task to an idle or low priority and then the functions will be executed when other tasks are finished and give up their time so additionally for the timers uh, there is still a need to define a queue length for the timer because each record means the initial time the length of the delay and the callback function and uh, you if you want to plan a lot of different tasks you have to increase the length of the timer queue to be able to put these events in the queue so that all of them fit and additionally semaphores require 88 bytes to be allocated in the heap so if you don't want them you can as well exclude mutexes by disabling the use mutexes macro in the Riartos configuration the question is how to reduce uh, the usage of RAM RAM will always be a short or a very expensive thing so uh, when you design your application again please check how much RAM you use in different objects some of them are necessary so you have to count with them however for tasks you should check how much memory you use and reduce the stack size in the definition it's a little bit dangerous thing you always have to leave some margin because uh, for normal input parameters for normal behavior of your application the task can run in a simple loop or the depth of the function call can be limited can be calculable but in case you get uh, wrong parameters or uh, some unknown or unexpected uh, value of parameters it can be by application mistake by a mistake of the incoming data such task can uh, get into the cycles and especially if it's uh, reentrant if it calls a function that calls itself or other function and there is a circular loop uh, the stack with the wrong input parameters can be exhausted very quickly so you have to count with that and uh, the trouble with testing is that uh, you can either test everything or just values you think can happen you have to be careful how you define your applications when uh, something happens and uh, your stack is corrupted and you get a task switch uh, to the task whose stack is corrupted the Friartos can check this situation and when such situation is detected by the watermark check and by a special area uh, at the bottom of the stack check it will call a hook called application stack overflow hook this is uh, an empty function but this function can be adapted by you and uh, at the moment when you land in the application stack overflow hook you know that uh, something bad happened and uh, the stack for a given task is destroyed so what you can do at this moment first record this event and uh, if uh, the application allows that you can try to restart the microcontroller very important thing is you probably would want to record such and you would as well want to record the parameters from a given task if it started with some uh, values 
it may be worth putting them in the trace. So it's very important to have some log of your function, especially in case of errors, because you can learn from them and you can uh, try to adapt your application later in the next version. But uh, please use the application stack overflow hook because uh, it can tell you that something really happened and uh, you should care about your application again. We can as well check how much empty space is in the heap. So there is a function that tells you uh, how much uh, free heap is available. And uh, that's important uh, for monitoring how many objects you can still define and allocate on the heap. One more thing, uh, this uh, uh, get free heap size doesn't give you the biggest block that you can allocate. Do you know why? You can still have 10 kilobytes uh, of the heap available, but you can't allocate a block with a one kilobyte in size. Uh, the function returns a sum of all empty blocks, but the empty blocks uh, can be uh, between already allocated parts of the heap. And if you sum them and each of them has a half kilobyte, in total they can have 10 kilobytes. But if the biggest block is half kilobyte, you can't allocate a new uh, task with a three kilobytes of the heap ne or the stack needed. It's a double edged sword. On one side, it gives you the empty space. On the other side, it doesn't give you how much you can allocate at once. Concerning the heap allocation, we will see, we will see uh, different uh, strategies for allocating the heap. And uh, you can choose these strategies uh, in the configuration. And the QBMX will reflect it by including uh, one of the five files that implement different heap allocation strategies. When uh, you look at uh, the design of your application, if you need to reduce the RAM, uh, please uh, write down the usage of your uh, stacks using the high watermarks for each of them and uh, try to reduce the size of the stack for each of your tasks and uh, try to think as well if you need so many tasks if for example some functionality can be combined together to use just one task and one stack for a given functionality then uh, think about uh, usage the timers whether you need to use them because this way you can uh, reduce the footprint by the stack of the timer task by the tcb of the timer task by the queue of the timer task so it gives quite a big benefit not using them same is valid for the mutexes and other elements so reduce from the configuration, all the elements not used in your application. Further, we can think about uh, using uh, uh, macro maximum number of priorities of the tasks, because the higher amount we use, the more memory we need and the less efficient algorithm can be used for distinguishing which of them will run. So reducing the number of priorities can help as well. So let's look at the memory allocation. We can choose uh, the total heap size in the configuration, which uh, is a parameter that uh, reserves a typically variable in the memory or heap in a memory. And uh, this will be passed to the free RTOS. Then you have to choose as well the algorithm, how the memory is allocated and deallocated. It's managed by heap one to heap five. And uh, now let's look how the heap operates. So we have got uh, the stack for the main application. So when we start the micro, uh, it needs some, uh, some stack for uh, calling different functions, calling startup functions, uh, clock setup and so on. Then there is uh, a beginning of uh, our memory where the standard C heap is defined. This can be pretty small, for example, only for a printf, because the standard C functions use the system heap, and uh, this system heap has to be defined. It can be very small, 
that has to be there. Further, the free RTOS heap is defined as a variable or block of memory defined in the RAM beyond the main application heap and before the main stack. So it's a block that you can allocate, you can say how big it will be, and the rest of the memory can be allocated for global variables. When you define the heap and the strategy how to use it, you are telling FreeRTOS, hey, now you can use this memory and it's under your control. So that's how the FreeRTOS gets its heap. Just give it, this is your memory, this is this size. In case of uh, a strategy heap 3, the FreeRTOS uses the standard malloc and free functions. So at that moment, uh, you are responsible for defining the application heap and uh, the FreeRTOS uses standard C functions to allocate and deallocate it. So let's look at uh, different models of memory allocation and uh, why the fragmentation can happen. In a uh, heap one strategy, uh, this uses uh, a first fit algorithm. So when you want a allocation, when you want a chunk of memory with a given size, uh, the heap one will simply take a free first empty part of the heap. It will allocate the newly uh, requested block. It will return the pointer, but heap one doesn't offer any deallocation. Uh, here in heap one, what you allocate, you can't remove from the memory. It has got this drawback, you can't reduce the memory footprint if you don't need something. So it stays in the heap forever. But it has uh, an advantage. If you have application with a fixed amount of objects, it's very effective because it doesn't need to search for empty blocks. It simply takes the last one and puts your request on top of the last one. So it's very fast. And uh, for safety applications, where you don't want to deal with a dynamic memory allocation, this is the best option. Because if you set up all the objects at the beginning, you know that you have all already placed in the heap and there is no danger of running out. The second strategy, heap two, uses a very uh, limited uh, way of emptying blocks. So you can see I'm allocating at the beginning three objects. So it allocates uh, three blocks in the heap. Then I deallocate two of them. And uh, suddenly these two become available. But if I deallocate even the last one, you can see that there are four blocks that can be allocated. However, they are not defragmented. So you have got four isolated blocks where you can still allocate less or up to the maximum size of the block, but not more. So heap two is not recommended because it keeps the memory very fragmented. And uh, if you uh, place a lot of small objects and you fill the heap and then remove these objects, you can't place anything bigger then. Heap three strategy uses uh, the C library functions malloc and free. So the implementation, whether the memory stays uh, fragmented or defragmented, depends on the implementation of these functions. Trouble with that is that you don't have control how these functions, malloc and free, are implemented. You typically don't have a source code from them and uh, they tend to be rather slow. One of the better options is an algorithm uh, implemented in heap4. Heap4 uses uh, free space defragmentation. So whenever you free a block, it looks if uh, the surrounding blocks are as well empty blocks. And if they are, it connects the blocks together. So at the end, uh, when you deallocate uh, all, all the blocks or uh, a couple of them, it keeps the blocks in uh, one big chunk 
that allows again to allocate bigger objects. So HIP4 is a preferred strategy. Yet, it has uh, one little disadvantage. It is still defined as one variable, so it fits only into one memory. You can find the definition of the HIP4 as a definition of this UC heap variable array. So you can see that uh, it's uh, defined. You can place it using linker or different attributes to different addresses or different RAM memories. If you look at uh, a memory map of our new microcontrollers, you can realize that uh, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, separate RAM blocks. For example, STM32H7 has uh, something like six or seven memory blocks. And uh, these memory blocks are in uh, not a continuous space. So one RAM begins at address uh, uh, 20 million hexa. The other RAM blocks begins at address 30 million hexa. So in total, you may have a one megabyte of RAM, but it is not a continuous space. So if you use heap four strategy, you could either choose a half megabyte block or 256 kilobyte block, but not one megabyte in total, which is solved by using a heap five. This is similar to heap four. However, it defines a table that uh, describes several different blocks, each block with its startup address and the size, and it finishes with a null and zero vector. So uh, when you choose the heap five and you call the port define heap regions, you put a pointer to this table and uh, FreeRTOS is then able to allocate uh, the requested memory size in any of these blocks. So suddenly you can use all the memory available in the microcontroller. Of course, uh, the allocated block will not cross the boundaries because it's a discontinuous RAM. But uh, it can still allocate the blocks in RAM 1, in RAM 2, RAM 3, RAM 5. So it gives you much more RAM for the <coughs> application usage. We can as well use alternate functions uh, to uh, operate with the memory because FreeRTOS uh, has uh, the option to use a pool the pool has uh, one advantage. It defines uh, memory blocks with a fixed size and it allocates to you the blocks of a fixed size from a defined pool. So the management of uh, these pools is simpler than dynamic memory allocation. On the other side, uh, uh, it is uh, not a recommended way of operation apart from some communication tasks. For example, pools are very effective for TCP IP, where you need to take the packets of the memory and uh, return them back quickly. So pools are much faster for implementation and for runtime. But uh, if you need to share different uh, sizes of data, dynamic allocation is better.